Welcome, everybody. I'm Mark David, founder of the Institute for the Psychology of Eating, and we are back in the Psychology of Eating podcast. I'm with Sophie today. Welcome, Sophie. Hi. Thank you for Hi. having me. Yes, I'm so glad we're doing this. And, you know, you and I will spend 45 minutes to an hour together. And the idea is for me to ask you questions, find out what you'd like to work on, and then hopefully move you forward in your relationship with food and body. So if you could wave your magic wand and get whatever you wanted, what would that be? <laughs> oh, that tough question. I've been thinking about that question a lot, actually. And um, on the surface level, what I would instantly say is stop binge eating. Um, but, but I wish it were that easy because I'm – I have always had a challenging relationship with food in a way where it has been a tool for self-empowerment and a weapon for self-destruction almost at the same time. So I wish I can work this out and kind of stop identifying myself with food. I guess that would be the, the answer. Okay. Uh, how old are you, Sophie? I'm 32. 32. And where are you from? I'm from Bulgaria. Bulgaria. Is that where you are right now? Yes, it is. Yay. So how old were you when you first started to notice ah, something's going on with me and food? So I think I was maybe 15 because what happened then was um, my dad's first suicide attempt and my first memories of overeating dates. Uh, back to that period. But I think actually the seed of my eating disorder was planted when I was about five. And it was through a very loving um, tradition that me and my parents shared. And it was, um, they would buy me a chocolate Kinder Egg every day when they picked me up from preschool. And that was kind of this, you know, conditioning where I started associating, you know, this, delicious thing with with comfort with safety with security with with home because i was a very kind of introverted kid and so it's been over 15 years now that i've struggled with this relationship but i guess it all started maybe even earlier sure so the struggle looks like what you mentioned binge eating um how else would you describe the struggle yeah, so I, in, in every domain of my existence, I am a very um, extreme person, very, very polar person. So I would, for instance, I have two gears. I've got stop and go. I've got, you know, either super productive, you know, high achieving or barely able to move. With food, it's been a lot like this. It's been either a very strict draconian dieting or, you know, binge eating. That was until I actually started playing around with this relationship from the perspective of somebody who wanted to feel empowered. And I started a food blog and I taught myself how to cook. I actually completely, um, left behind my um, cravings for junk food. I taught myself to love nutritious food, to crave nutritious food. That was, a, that was a great accomplishment. However, my relationship with myself, myself, my sense of identity has always been tied to how I'm dealing with food, whether I'm overeating, whether I'm dieting, whether I like my body and all of this stuff. So it's been very turbulent and very self-abusive in a way. So tell me a little bit more about your parents. Are they both still around? Are they both still alive? Yeah, they are alive. Um, I love my parents uh, tremendously. They, they did the best that, I, that they could with what they had available. Um, but they've, they've also not been a part of this particular challenge just because maybe they didn't understand it. And I was excellent at, um, you know, concealing that. Um, but yeah, my, my mom was actually diagnosed with breast cancer in the beginning of this year. Thankfully she's, she's okay. But, um, I've had challenging 
you know, um, experiences with both of them that have maybe in a way um, contributed to the fact that I was searching for comfort in food. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, by the way, I'm going to be bouncing around for just a little bit here. So I can, it's, it's it's just oftentimes the way my brain works, but there is a method to the madness. So. Oh, I'm all for the cast. I'm all for creative cast. I know how that works. <laughs> Great. Let's do it. Thank you. So are you wanting to lose weight? Right now I do um, because I'm actually recovering from the scariest episode of major depression that I've ever experienced. I was in a really tough uh, space during the summer. I had no energy to, to exercise. I was overeating a lot. So the result is that I, I'm again uh, in a place where I don't like my body. Mm-hmm. How much weight did you gain? I don't know. I haven't been on a scale forever. Really. How much weight do you want to lose? I'm not for numbers. I am for feeling good about how I look mostly, how my clothes um, feel, um, how my body feels when I move. Uh, For me, for years, touching my stomach or my my inner thighs, you know, rubbing together, that was just a nightmare. It was absolutely humiliating. And I'm in the process of trying to heal that. But, you know, it's not a linear process as you... No. Yeah. So when was the last time you would say I weighed what I wanted to weigh and I felt how I wanted to feel? It was in the beginning of this summer, actually. I was in the best shape of my life and it, I accomplished like I, I got there in the healthiest way possible. I was just exercising and loving it. And I was doing it not out of compulsion, but out of just I needed, I was actually uh, relocated to the Netherlands briefly uh, because of um, the pandemic. It killed my business. I had to restart my life. I moved abroad. I found a wonderful place to exercise there. And so, you know, long story short, basically six months ago, I was, um, I was in the best shape of my life. And soon after, I actually ended up in the scariest depression. So it was a very strange period for me. Can you say what you think caused you to go into depression? Well, I struggled with depression for over a decade. Um, I, I have at least one major episode per year. Uh, it's, I mean, I have a genetic predisposition. My, my dad has um, two suicide attempts. My mom uh, was depressed for five years when I was a toddler. So my, my aunt was schizophrenic. There is a lot of baggage here. And also the last six years of my life have been just the most insane roller coaster of one major hit on my psyche after another and basically all hell broke loose and that's what um what happened was there a particular hit this summer that 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 sort of stimulated the depression well, I could say the fact that I moved to a new country on my own. Um, my mom was diagnosed with breast cancer. I was trying to restart my life, build a business from scratch. At the same time, I was navigating you know, a foreign administration. We were in lockdown with curfew. Um, it was a lot. Yes, yes, yes. So where would you say you're in the depression journey right now? Thankfully, I mean, today, to be honest, today hasn't been great. The past few days haven't been great. But thankfully, I, I met a phenomenal therapist over the summer who, instead of, um, you know, uh, telling me to take countless pills, which a different therapist had done before that, but she encouraged me to start making art. And that literally saved my life. So right now, I am in a place where I'm not fully out of it but uh, life i i, I want to exist let me put it this way i i i um i can envision a brighter life i can i can sense that things will be getting better and that was not the case for several months mm. are you in a relationship these days yeah i've been with uh, this person for over eight years now how many years over eight eight, over and a half. eight years yeah. wow that's been a while 
it's been a while. We've been through a lot. We um, we lost a baby. I had a miscarriage in 2016. That was one of the one of the things that I mentioned. Um, one of the hits, mm-hmm. and uh, he's been by my side through everything, really. Mm. Do you have Do you have plans on having another child? We don't know. We mm-hmm. don't know. Yes. 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 I'm sorry you had to go through that. I can't imagine. And yeah, I, I just I just can't imagine. Thank you for saying that. I'm just going to quickly mention that I am actually grateful for that because I like to say that I'm a neurotic overachiever in recovery. I was a really stressed out, self-destructive person when, when I was pregnant with that baby. And I don't think I would have been the mom that a baby deserves if I had it. So um, I'm, I'm grateful that that happened. Um, I'm, I think I'm over it. I hope I am. Yeah, well, well, that's, if there's a learning and a lesson to take out of that experience, then that's certainly a beautiful one because clearly it's made you a better person. It's made you a better woman and 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 I'm sure a better better mother and mother material. Um, yeah, that's that that is that is surely my belief. So so you know you want to lose weight, but it's more like a feeling as opposed to you know a number on a scale. Well, yeah. When are there times that you've noticed? Sophie, that you say to yourself, wow, you know, I had a bunch of good days and I wasn't really worried about food and I wasn't thinking about my body that much. And I just felt more freedom than I usually feel. Does it ever happen to you? I'm thinking and I do have a lot of good days, but for me, I think I've done something that I don't know how to how to break the pattern because even though I know I should not be multitasking as I eat, I've actually conditioned myself to, to eat as I watch something or listen to a podcast and draw at the same time. And combining these things actually give me a great sense of enjoyment and pleasure on a daily basis. And even in periods where, I'm not overeating or I'm not feeling bad about my body. This is a, this is a part of my routine. And I know I probably need to break that pattern, um, but I don't know how to go about it. And maybe one thing I need to mention, I have lived without a sense of smell since I was like, I never, I don't remember ever being able to smell anything. And so I've experienced food in a different way. And I'm not sure if that's, in any way related to my challenge, but I, I thought I should just mention it. Yes. Thanks for mentioning it. Um, how's your sense of taste? Oh, it's very sharp. It's actually really heightened. Um, I, I actually used to design recipes and create concepts for, for meals from scratch. I love layering textures and ingredients and combining different, all sorts of, you know, natural ingredients just to, please my my taste buds um that's kind of how i maybe compensated for the lack of um, the ability to smell yes 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 uh, you mentioned the word or you mentioned the term uh recovery and you said you know i'm in recovery what does that mean for you um well to be honest maybe it's more aspirational than um, than, than the reality um i am extremely Self-abusive uh, in minor dialogue, self-critical, um, ruthless, perfectionist. I, I'm a millennial, and um, you know that's maybe a part of the of the challenge. But I I want to believe that I am a little bit more um, a little bit kinder to myself um, than I used to be, and a little bit more tolerant of. Um, certain imperfections or certain things that I deem less than what I would like them to be. So in that sense, I, I, I think I'm in recovery. I'm not as mean to myself as I used to be, but still um, minor monologue has been just awful um, for yes. my life. Yes. Yes. I understand that term. And 
and why you would use it. And really the reason why I asked about that and, and yes, it makes sense. You're recovering from a part of your life that sort of had you feeling a little bit beat up because if you're beating yourself up, you're going to want to recover at some point. If you're Mm -hmm. self-abusing, you're going to want to feel, Oh, I'm recovering. I'm rejuvenating. I'm regenerating. I think a piece of the puzzle here is you beginning to consider a different story about your life, a different frame for your story. You shared pieces about your story. And I always look at our story as our movie and it's our beautiful movie. It's our beautiful journey. And in my experience, the more you and I can look at our story from the early days of when, you know, your parents picked you up from school and brought you chocolate. And then when things got difficult for you as a teenager and you notice yourself turning to food, I'm always interested in how can we look at our story and make it right, make it righteous, make it a good one, make it a great movie. Because if you went to see a movie and everything's great for every character, then ah, it's going to be a little bit boring. You want to see a little drama. Um, You want to see a character arc where, you know, maybe it looks like they're starting out on top and then they have their difficulties and then they have their challenges. And then all of a sudden they resurrect. And that's a theme for many human beings is that we have to find ourselves in the midst of a life story, a life journey that's been challenging. So yes, you're in recovery, but I think more to the point, you're, you've just been on a growth trajectory, meaning your life is one of increasingly becoming more you, becoming more Sophie, becoming more of your potential. And yeah, you got these, you got these speed bumps, you got these roadblocks, you've got these challenges, and you've slowly worked with them. And here you are right now, and you're not exactly where you want to be. But I, when, when I hear your story, I don't hear a person in recovery. I hear a person who's in development. I see, you know, you're, you're like the work of art that you create. If you sit down and you're painting or drawing, and after five minutes, you still only have a little bit in there, it wouldn't be fair for me to look at that and say, oh, that's that's deficient. <laughs> it's incomplete. There's a problem. There's stuff missing. It's like, no, it's a work of art. It's in creation. And look at this part of the creation. And then there's going to be moments of, gosh, I don't know what to do next. And then moments of inspiration. And then moments where things start to flow. And then there's maybe a moment where it feels like it's finished for a moment and you can just sit back and go, oh, wow, that's nice. So I would love for you to see you as that work of art that's in progress and you're the artist. Um, I don't know. It's uh, it's very interesting you're saying this, though, because I... I've struggled with labeling myself my entire life. I joke that I'm like a human octopus. I've got at least three hearts and nine brains and I'm a trained journalist and I used to work in IT and I was a social entrepreneur and I did a million things and I never felt like I belong anywhere to anything until I dared to call myself an artist, actually. And um, to me, art is an act of self-empowerment because it's a unique process of self-discovery and self-expression and self-exploration in a way that can do it wrong Mm -hmm. um really and so maybe maybe art is the missing piece for me maybe i should just keep at it and turn my life into canvas i don't know well at least symbolically and metaphorically and emotionally and spiritually and energetically, meaning 
you're the art, you're the creation, your life is the work of art. And who's to say what that work of art should look like? Yeah, maybe it's, I've got my my hands in so many different things. I have so many different skill sets. I have so many different interests. Great. That's the art that is Sophie. That's you. And really, to, to me, what it sounds like is that you've tapped into an archetype that truly speaks to you and is healing for you. An archetype, meaning the artist is a timeless, eternal identity. It's an, it's a timeless, eternal persona. And as soon as you talk to another artist, you can feel each other. You know what you mean. You know what you're saying. Even if the art itself is different, the inner working of, yes, this is creation. Yes, this is empowering. And yes, creating art as an artist is a journey. Mm-hmm. And the artist has to go to certain places in herself to find certain things. She has to quiet certain places of herself to create. An artist is able to declare uh, sort of, here's, here's what I'm creating. Here's what's unfolding. And I might change it. I might add to it. I might take something away. So it's a process. It never stops. The creation never stops. So when I say you found an archetype, you found a way to identify yourself so that you belong in this world. Yeah. Yeah. And that belonging sounds important to you um, because we need to have a sense of place and so many human beings, we have the belief, and rightfully so, I'm different. I don't belong because I see the world maybe a little different from my parents and people are doing all these things at school. I don't like that. I want to do something else. And kids do this and I want to do that. And people say one thing and they don't. So as kids, we really pick up on things. Kids are extremely sensitive And it's easy to conclude for many children, I I don't fit in and I don't belong. And if you and I don't fit in and if we don't belong, then we have to figure out a way to medicate and feel better. So food in a strange way and trying to manipulate your body to look a certain way has been your earliest attempt at art. <laughs> because well, I, you know, never, I never looked at it that way, that's for sure. Yeah, so it's been your earliest attempt at art, meaning it's a creation. You, food is your palette. The food you like, that's your palette. That's the colors that you use. These are the things that make me feel good. These are the things that don't make me feel good. I want to use this in my art. We talk about the culinary arts. Cooking is an art. Dining is an art. Being a waiter or a waitress it can be an art form. Yeah. Um, tasting is an art. So it's, it's meaning it's a canvas. It's a place where we can create. And oh, wow, if I can move around the food on my plate, I can create this body. I can make this body my palate, I can make it look the way I want it to. I can make it feel the way I want it to. So it is extremely accurate that how we move food around on the plate, on the palate, on the painting palette. Yeah, it can, it can change how I feel. It could change my energy. It could change my weight. It could change my health. So that's all true for you. And it's not your only art. It's a sub art. Mm -hmm. Your more important art is you and your life. And the person that you want to be. And I think where you're at right now is you're discovering that you're coming to realize that, that the art is all about, yeah, yeah, you're going to work on food. Yes, you're going to work on your relationship with it for sure. 
but also part of the artist's way is to hmm, is to look for where the inspiration is. I think what happens when it comes to the body is, and I really wonder for you, when you talked about the summertime, when you started out really great, I was exercising, I felt really wonderful. You know, I get that. You were on a roll. You were probably on a hot streak. And a lot of times we get a temporary high from a certain way of exercising and a certain way of eating. Yeah. Just everything comes together. Right place, right time. Things are working out. And we get this high. And you think, we think, I have to get back to that high in order to be the real me, because that high was me. I looked in the mirror. I like my body. I looked at how my clothes fit. I like that. I must get back to that high to be me. I don't know that that's true. And it's a, um, how do I want to say, it's a nuance of understanding mm -hmm. because you can, I don't know, you could have a bunch of alcohol and feel really high and relaxed. Does that mean you have to keep going back there in order to feel high and relaxed? You can do drugs and feel expansive and wonderful. Does that mean you should be on drugs all the time? Mm -hmm. So part of it is you, I, I think also setting a different course, charting a different path for how you're creating your relationship with your body. Okay. I'm speaking in artist terms. You're creating a relationship with your body. Meaning you get to paint this how it looks. Granted, it's not always easy, but being an artist and a creator is not always easy. Creation is, it, it's like giving birth. There's, there's a little bit of pain. Sometimes there's a little bit of blood. There's a little bit of screaming. Mm -hmm. Birth isn't always easy. So creation isn't always easy. And if you're looking to create something that's not really in alignment with who you are, pain and suffering is usually predictable. What I'm saying is that there's a part of you that is very habituated, I think, to my body has to look a certain way and feel a certain way. Yeah, yeah. Well, it all goes back to, you know, re being rejected multiple times and desperately trying to find a way to accept myself and, and like myself and approve of myself. So, yes, exactly. So now you're 32, you're wiser, you're older. You have a lot of experience in life for a 32-year-old. You've been in an eight-year relationship that's had a lot of challenges and ups and downs, and it sounds like it's still going strong. So we can say that you are loved and accepted. <laughs> you have two I guess parents. I've always been more accepted and loved by the outside world than I have been by myself. That's... <laughs> The strive to to be enough is like an endless, um, I don't know, marathon for me. Um, yes. That's why I'm suggesting to you that a way to heal that, a way to transform that is for you to use your smarts and you're a smart lady to start to gather evidence that I am loved and accepted for who I am. I don't care if you don't love and accept yourself fully or completely, or if there still feels like there's a hole. Of course, I care about that. But all I'm saying is your brain, your mind needs to start making the shift like, oh, wait a second. I keep telling myself you're not loved. You're not accepted. Why? Because I don't love me. I don't accept me. And that's what you hear. Yeah. And if I'm hearing 
I don't love myself. I don't accept myself. No love, no acceptance. I'm not going to notice it as much on the outside. And I'm not going to be able to receive the gift that's constantly coming at me. So that's why I'm saying it would be a great exercise for you to just do an inventory, just journal, bullet point list, all the ways that you are loved and accepted from others. Your parents, your partner, your friends, people you work with, people from the past. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure there's maybe people who rejected you in the past. Fine. Let's gather evidence of how you're loved and accepted so you can begin to feel that more. Because normally what you're trying to do is, okay, well, if I can just eat like this, then I love and accept myself. Yeah. If I could just look like this, then I love and accept myself. That's, that's, a, lot of, that, that's a lot of pressure. Yeah. It's taking love and acceptance and putting it in this teeny tiny little box. It would be no different than if you said to your parents or your partner, I will love and accept you all when you lose 10 pounds. <laughs> but for now, I'm not going to love and accept you all. Yeah. Sounds silly. Yeah. So you're harnessing your internal dialogue more. Um, just understanding that you are the artist archetype, that that's an important archetype for you. That's you harnessing your inner conversation and looking at your life as a creator and creations that you make. What you thinking? What you feeling? Oh, a lot. <laughs> I'm I'm thinking that I seem to be trying different strategies and I always end up with the same type of repetitive behaviors that I know don't work for me. I mean, I know make me feel bad um, and I wonder why I do that. I wonder if I can, if I should do something to change it or I should come to terms with it and accept it and then it will resolve on its own. I don't know. What do you think about that? Um, so big yes to accepting everything that you are and everything that you do and how you behave and the behaviors that you do that you've been trying to change. So very, very big yes to that. Before anything changes long-term in us, it often needs to be accepted. So you know from experience that your strategies, whatever they have been, are not working for you. Yeah. And those unwanted behaviors are still there because we're going after the behaviors. You're attacking the behaviors. You're addressing the behaviors. How do I stop this behavior? And the behaviors are there for a reason. They are a symptom. They are a reflection of what's going on in your psyche, in your soul, in your system, in your emotions, in your worldview. Yeah, and I mean, it's, it's actually one of the hardest things when it comes to... Uh food, I'm going to go back to that, is that it's not like I can say, okay, certain types of experiences trigger these behaviors. I, it's not like I can see a pattern because it, see, it all seems very chaotic. I tend to overeat when I'm feeling sad, when I'm feeling scared, when I'm feeling depressed, but I also tend to overeat when I'm happy, when I'm excited, when I'm, and I don't see what, what am I missing here. And does it even matter or I should focus on something else? Maybe I don't see the bigger picture. Okay. So on one level, I, I want to try to make this as simple as possible in terms of how I see some of these behaviors. Yes. So I use food when I'm sad. I use food when I'm depressed. I use food when I'm anxious. I use food when I'm happy. 
Like what, what's going on with that? Um, one thing in common is that you're simply using food to accompany you on your journey and you're using food to regulate your emotional experience. And, you know, because honestly, sometimes there's a part of us, you know, if I'm too happy, if I go too high, then you're flying too high and it's easy to fall and it's easy to crash and burn. So it's, it's easy, sort of the manic depressive thing. So there's a built-in mechanism that, okay, I'm really happy. Let me just tone it down a bit. It's not a conscious thought, but if I'm really happy and excited and I eat enough food, I will be kind of more mellow and I'll start to flatten that experience. And if I'm depressed, yeah, food makes me feel better. I'm anxious. Food makes me feel better. So there's no, there's no big secret there. It's a habit that all human beings in all of existence for all time have learned since infancy. Feel bad, eat food, feel better. Food will help regulate my emotional range and my emotional experience. So it's an automatic and unconscious habit for you. Yeah. Yeah. So, and we go to that habit, you go to that habit because that's what you know. That's what you've always done. That's what works for you. Additionally, because you because we try to control our world from the very beginning, when we realize as young people, like, gosh, there's problems here. There's problems with my parents. There's problems with my dad. There's problems with this and that. And we realize we have no control. We symbolically try to exert control. Yeah. And the way humans, one of the most common ways that a human being symbolically tries to have the feeling of control is, well, if I can't control my life, if I can't control the emotions of my parents, if I can't control my world, if I can't control my teachers, all the kids around me, I can certainly control food. And I could control my weight because you know something, there's a benefit to controlling that because then I could have this great body and this great weight and this great shape, and then everybody loves me. And ta-da. Yeah. So there's the why. That's mm -hmm. why we do that. And it's an okay strategy at the beginning when you're young because that's all you know. It's actually a smart strategy. Yeah. As a child, you did what you knew how to do. Let me turn to food because this makes me feel better. Let me try to order my eating experience oh, wait a second, I'm binge eating. Well, I'm binge eating because it somehow regulates my emotions, but then I might feel a little guilty. So let me stop binge eating. So then I have control. And the binge eating and the wanting to control food, the food is not the problem. No. Yeah, it's the symptom. It's, it's the solution, actually, in a weird yes. way. Yes, yes, it's the solution to the challenge called, how do I be Sophie? How do I be me with mm -hmm. the challenges I've had in life, with the issues that I have to deal with? How do I be me? How do I love myself? How do I take care of myself? How do I nourish myself? How do I accept myself? Now I'm starting to think, do you think maybe in some way, to some extent, I may be subconsciously loyal to food for the fact that initially it was my source of support and in some way maybe I'm, I'm afraid to abandon a part of me? Is that possible, do you think? I'm going to say no. And, okay. and, and, and the only reason I'm saying no is... Like, yeah, maybe, but it's, I, I think there might be a little bit of overthinking in there because the reality is uh, more so than you're being loyal to food, you're being a human being who eats. You and I must be loyal to food because food keeps us alive. We must have a certain connection to food because food makes you feel good. Uh, take, take any human who has a quote unquote healthy relationship with food and body, food makes them feel good. Your favorite foods make you feel good and it continues your life. So 
we already have an intimate connection with food. You will always have an intimate connection with food. So your learning now more than ever with your artist self, how to paint your relationship with food. So it's more creative in your thinking about it and it works better for you. And Again, part of that is you're already doing it, which is you're starting to feed yourself in a whole different way. And when I say feed yourself, meaning you have learned that creation as an artist is food for you. Yeah. It doesn't have to be your profession. It could, it, it's, it, it could just be who you are when you finish work. This is, this is, this is how I express myself. That is literally nutrition for your soul. That is literally food for you. The more you give yourself the foods and the nutrients you really need, the less dependency you're going to have on food itself. You need art. You need to create. You need to feel the act of creation. That has nothing to do with Oh, everybody, look at my pretty painting. Do you all love me? No, you're not trying to impress anybody. I, I mean, yeah, if somebody likes it, great. But you're creating for you. It's, it, it, when you described it, it sounded very self-satisfying. It is, yeah. Okay, so that's the feeling. The feeling that you have when you create and you feel self-satisfied, that's the feeling that I will say is what you're looking for for you, for you to be able to take a walk and stop and look at the sun or the sky or the clouds and say, Sophie, God, this feels so satisfying. Just me being alive outside, nothing else to do. Yeah. I don't have to weigh anything. I don't have to eat this or don't eat that. Yeah, you might come home later on and all of a sudden get confused around eating, but it's about having moments where you have the feeling of I'm self-satisfied. Now, right now, art is giving that to you. Great. That's how you feel it then. But all I'm saying is that's the feeling we're looking to multiply mm -hmm. because that's the feeling that you really want from eating perfectly and having the ideal body is you want to feel self-satisfied. Yeah. You want to go, ah, I don't have to do anything else. This feels good. I got there. Well, you're going to get that feeling not from controlling food. Controlling food and having the body that you think you want is not going to get you that feeling because it hasn't, at least sustainably long term. Yeah. 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 So to me, what happened for you in the summer is sort of symbolic of the journey in a weird way. I don't know if this is true, but I'm postulating a part of that experience where you went from this high to this low. Mm is just teaching you that that high is not your truest resting place. That, mm -hmm. That's not your target. I also want to say, uh, this is slightly changing the topic, but not really. Um, this is just a piece about the depression that might be useful for you to explore at some point. You know, when depression runs in the family, it's, it's, um, it's noteworthy. Is it genetic? Is it biochemical? Is it energetic? Is it a soul? Is it karma? It's probably some mixture of all of the above. But what is often missed with depression is there's a a chunk of people who their depression is actually triggered by stress and anxiety and overwhelm. Yeah. And it's technically a freeze response. So in nature, it's fight or flight. The lion is chasing you. It's fight or flight. But there's another stress response, which is to freeze. You just go, oh. 
and a lot of people who experienced depression, what really happened was there was life experience that was too overwhelming for them. And when things get too overwhelming, one of the ways we deal with that is we just turn off. Yeah. Well, that's exactly how I felt over the summer. I mean, this one was the worst by far. And my brain was literally functioning at 20%. I couldn't articulate my thoughts. I couldn't communicate with people. It was just, I was on, I don't know, it was barely existing. So I'm guessing that that's, uh, that's exactly right. It's kind of like a mechanism for self-preservation in a way, maybe. Yes, exactly. So it's literally helping you survive because your system couldn't take any more. It just couldn't handle what was happening. So there's too much sensory input coming in. There's too much anxiety. There's too much confusion. I'm shutting off. I'm going on 20% brain capacity. I'm not going to hear 80% of what you're saying and you're saying and yours is too much. So that's actually a protection. Yeah. So all I'm saying is you can forgive yourself for that. And your issue is not depression per se. Once again, the depression is just symptomatic of you learning how to handle your life better and better. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not that you did something wrong. It's, it's, It's that, wow, that was just too overwhelming for me. And by the way, understandably so, because COVID times has been tremendously stressful for many human beings around the planet. So it's not like you're doing something wrong. You're being impacted deeply by your environment. Yeah. So, so this is part of the restoring, having a different story about yourself And I just want to remind you of a couple of uh, uh, pieces of this conversation here. One piece of the conversation that I, I would like for you to, to really consider is you creating a new path for yourself or a new goal for yourself around your body and your weight, different from how it's been. I think the old you has been looking for a certain weight and you assess that not from weighing yourself, but you're assessing it from your clothes and you're assessing it from looking at your body mm -hmm. and a certain feeling that you know happens when you hit a certain amount. So what I'm saying is that is unreliable. That is no different from me saying, okay, well, when I drink enough shots of whiskey, then I'm going to be in the exact place I want to be. So I'm saying you've been, you're going for what has been for you a temporary high. Mm -hmm. And I would love to see you let go of for now, for now, for now, for now, just, just give yourself some months to let go of having to lose weight, having to feel a certain fit in your clothes, have clothes that fit you for this body right now and call off the part of you that is trying to change your body so you can love yourself more and inhabit this body, start to occupy this body. It's no different than if you were working on a canvas and while you're working on the canvas, you know, I don't want to work on this canvas. I want to work on another canvas. This canvas isn't any good. It's actually too big. I want something just. And then you're not present with your art. You're not present with yourself. You're not present with your creation. You're wishing for a different canvas, but that's the only one you've got right now. So. You've spent a long time trying to have a certain goal with your body. That goal hasn't gotten you where you want to go. So all I'm saying, let's just relax that goal for a while. We're going to just put it to the side. I'm fine if you pick it up at some point, but I want you to have the experience called, huh, 
I'm going to just let go for a number of months of that conditional goal. The conditional goal being when I make a certain amount of money, then I love myself. But if I don't have that amount of money, I hate myself. Mm -hmm. If I have this body, I love myself. I don't have it. I hate myself. So as soon as you have that goal of I will love my body when I look a certain way, then food becomes more important. You go into stress response because, oh, my God, this is this is life threatening. If I don't get what I want, I'm going to die like a part of us believes if I don't get what I want, I'm not going to survive. Some part of me dies. I'm not going to live. I'm not going to be who I am. And when we're, when we're in a, that kind of stress response, we make poor choices. I eat when I'm happy. I eat when I'm sad. I eat when I'm depressed. I eat when I'm excited. And it's harsh and it's mostly driven by this unfulfilled goal of, yeah, but when I get to a certain place with my body, then I'm going to love myself and everything's going to be okay. So you need to have the feeling called, hmm, I wonder what's it going to be like when you take away that condition from yourself? When you take a vacation from the condition called Sophie needs to weigh a certain amount and eat a certain way in order to be lovable and acceptable. Yeah. It's going to be an interesting experience. <laughs> well, it has been. <laughs> Your life sounds like it's been pretty interesting. That's for sure. It is not boring with me. Never. Yes. Yeah. So it'll likely continue to be interesting, but in a more interesting sort of way. <laughs> you know, well, like I mentioned, I am actually a trained journalist. I am a storyteller, so I might as well just write my own story, tell my own, retell my own story, rewrite my own existence. Maybe that can help. Yes. And look at everything that's happened in the past as sort of life painting you, life creating you, life adding these colors, adding these experiences to help you learn, to help you grow, to help you become more of who you are. Because you're a powerful woman, you're a present woman, you're an aware woman, you're a sensitive woman, you're a woman who has relationships and connection in her life. That's all very beautiful. Is it perfect? No, but nobody's life is perfect. Oh, no. Yeah. Um... There's a lot going on in my mind right now, and it's, um, I'm really grateful for the for the valuable perspectives. That's uh, that's been I, I've been excited about this conversation for a while. I'm glad. I I I would love for you to consider that your life is no longer I'm in recovery, but your life is I'm creating my life. And I'm, I'm painting my life and, and it's, and it's not always going to be easy, but here's how I'm creating. And when you're, when you're being an artist, you create certain conditions around you such that you can be in the artist moment and in the artist way. Okay. You might create a little bit of quiet. You might turn off your cell phone. You might turn on some music. You might have a certain lighting. You're creating conditions where you can thrive yeah. and creation can happen. So really what we've been talking about is creating conditions where you can thrive and create. Letting go of conditions that don't help you thrive and create. The condition called... Sophie has to look a certain way and weigh a certain amount in order to be loved and acceptable. That doesn't help you create. It puts you in a corner. It puts you in a stress response. No reasonable creation has ever happened probably in human history from a pure stress response. When we're in a stress response, you're fighting for your life. You're not creating a great work of art. 
that's for sure. A lot to consider, Sophie, yes? A lot, a lot, definitely, a lot to process. I'm going to be watching the recording multiple times. I'm so glad. I, I'm, I'm really glad we had this conversation. And I, you know, I'm over here in Boulder, Colorado. You're in Bulgaria. And, and I'm thinking this whole time that I'm in conversation with you that you are in such a beautiful place. Because you're 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 flowering like never before. Mm -hmm. And yes, it's not perfect. And at the same time, you're letting go of old patterns that don't work for you. And it's and when I say old patterns, it's not about what you eat, when you eat it, how you eat it. No, it's not about that. It's about how you're thinking about food. It's about how you're thinking about your body. And it's about understanding that there's other forms of nourishment that need to show up more in your life. And you're already doing that. Yeah. I'm excited for you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for a great conversation. Thank you, Mark. Yeah. Bye -bye. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Take care, my friends. More to come. Hey, friends. We're so happy that you've joined us for another episode of The Psychology of Eating with Mark David. Are you loving these episodes? Then simply subscribe and you'll never miss an episode again. We'd also love it if you'd leave us a comment below so we can hear more about your own journey with food and body. And if you're curious about what we offer at the Institute for the Psychology of Eating, including our internationally acclaimed coach certification training that's rooted in dynamic eating psychology and mind-body nutrition, please head on over to our website, psychologyofeating.com. Until next time, take care. And remember, having the body you want starts with loving the body you have.